Our character vanishes in a cloud of darkness, and from within that darkness, they unleash a volley of eldritch blasts and scorching rays, reducing their enemy to nothing but a pile of flaming cinders. Welcome to D&D build number 18, Draconic Sorlock. My name is Nathan, and I release these videos about Dungeons & Dragons 5th, 5th edition uh, once a week, typically on Saturdays or Sundays, depending on my schedule. Now, uh, this build, I know as well as all the other builds I've made, are detailed in a spreadsheet that, that is linked in the description of this video. So if at any point you want to check any of those out, you can use the link there. Now, also, if there's at any point during the video you have a comment or a question or uh, perhaps a similar experience, please let me know in the comments. I would love to hear about it. So let's jump right in. Uh, to our intro and agenda. So uh, I'm, I'll introduce and kind of talk about the, the concept of this build. Then I'll talk about levels one through 17. So I'll talk about level one, levels two through six, levels seven through nine, levels 10 through 13, and levels 14 through 17 before summarizing. And each of those key thresholds, so level six, level nine, level 13, and level 17, I'm gonna give a damage report and kind of talk about the tactics of this character and the kind of damage that they can output. So let's jump into our build concept. What does this build feature? Well, this is a burst damage or Nova build. This focus on having a large volume of accurate hits. Uh, we're also gonna be pretty well-rounded defensively with armor, a, a bunch of de defensive spells, as well as um, obscuration. So our character is gonna be very hard to see and target. We're also gonna have a pretty decent amount of hit points for a full kind of blaster caster type character. One of the other cool thing about this is that on this character, our Nova kit, uh, the spells that we're going to use, it doesn't take very many. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility available in our other sp spell choices. Now, that said, this is a sorcerer. Sorcerers don't get to know very many spells. And so depending on what you want, you have to be pretty ju judicious about your selections. Another cool thing about this character is that the resources that we're going to use to deal burst damage are going to be generally available after a short rest. Now, we are primarily going to uh, focus on single target on this character, but they do have a pretty good ability due to do error of effect blasting when required. This build also has a really strong foundation for role playing and story elements, just with the overall themes and flavors of this character. And uh, I will talk more about that as we get into the build. And finally, the only books that you need to create this character are the Player's Handbook and Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Now, I will be referencing spells out of other books, um, and you are more than welcome to use those, but the only things that you need to realize the core concept of this build are those two books. All right, so at level one, we are starting in Sorcerer. And as a first level Sorcerer, we don't get proficiency with any armor. We, we get daggers, darts, and slings, as well as staffs and light crossbows for weapon proficiencies. Uh, we also get proficiency in constitution and charisma saves. The cool thing about being proficient in constitution saves is it will help us maintain our concentration on spells. And as a spellcaster who is planning on concentrating on spells, this is a big deal. Now, as a first level sorcerer, we get our spellcasting as well as our sorceress origin. This is our subclass. I'm going to be taking the draconic bloodline on this character. This gives us a couple things. First, we get a dragon ancestor. And you can pick out of a list. There's a bunch of different colors of chromatic and metallic dragons you want to use brass or red so you'll be aligned with fire and this doesn't give you anything associated with that here but it all uh, it doesn't give you expertise um, you can double your proficiency bonus on any uh, abil ability check with charisma that has to do with dragons so if you're talking to dragons and that kind of thing it could be an interesting class for a campaign like that we also get draconic resilience so what this does is when we're not wearing armor, we can calculate our armor class as 13 plus our dexterity modifier. And additionally, we get one extra hit point per level that we have in this class. This is nice. It's kind of like a free mage armor, so to speak. And the extra health uh, is, you know, it's helpful, but but it's not that big of a deal. Um, but but uh, yeah, this is a pretty cool and flavorful uh, subclass. And we'll kind of talk more about it. It's not necessarily the best sorcerer subclass. And there's one reason I'm taking it become clear at Sorcerer 6 down the line. Um, but, uh, and, you, and you can definitely use other Sorcerers for a build like this, and it should work just fine. Nonetheless, we're taking Draconic Bloodline. Now, 
for our our race we are going with the half elf today once again i am back to using half elf and if you saw you know high accuracy and half elf you probably guessed correctly this will be an elven accuracy build so as a half elf we are a medium creature with a 30 foot speed we have dark vision out to range of 60 feet these are pretty standard things for most races we also get fate ancestry so we have advantage on saving throws against being charmed and magic can't put us to sleep and then we get two skill proficiencies if your group uses any of the half elf variant rules like out of the sword coast adventurers guide you are more than welcome to take one of those um i might go with the drow heritage to get extra castings of certain spells um but yeah uh any other heritage other than the general one is just fine now in terms of other racial options for this build you can pick pretty much any other elf you'll basically lose a couple points to one of your tertiary stats um but, you know, a, a Wood Elf for extra speed or a Shadar Kai for teleportation and that kind of thing would be very good on, on this character. I personally like the idea of a Half Elf that, and Draconic Sorcerer that perhaps our character is, you know, Half Dragon or there's a dragon somewhere in their ancestry and that kind of thing. And that's where their magic comes from. Now, in terms of our ability scores, we are using the point by method as always. So I'm going to get a 13 dexterity and put one of our plus one there. I'm going to get a 15 constitution and put a plus one there. And then I'm going to get a 12 wisdom and then a 15 charisma with our racial plus two there. Now, if you are not a half elf, you will not get a plus two and two plus ones. You will get a plus two and a plus one. So you, you would drop your wisdom to 10 to have a 14 dexterity and a 16 constitution in this case. If you were okay with having a lower constitution, you could absolutely boost some of your other stats. And that depends on your table on how you want to build your character. Now, uh, this uh, gives us a starting hit points of 10. We get six out of our class, one from our Draconic Resilience and three from Constitution for a total of 10. And for our spell choices here, we get four, uh, and we get four cantrips here. Uh, I would take Mind Sliver and Firebolt for damage at this level, uh, and Minor Illusion and Mage Hand for kind of out of combat utility. You can pick whatever you want. I really do like Mind Sliver. Um, and uh, I think it can potentially be a very useful thing, especially when we need to lean into a more control focused play style. As a first level full caster, we get two spell slots of first level and we get to know two spells of our choice. And I would take shield to help us stay alive here and burning hands at this level, just as kind of an AOE blasting option. But, oh, and, and for our uh, opening equipment, we're, we're going to use the gold buy method. Uh, sorcerers get an average of 10 of 75 gold pieces on gold buy plus 10 probably out of your background. And this is exactly enough to get scale mail, a shield, and then an arcane focus or a component pouch. Now, we don't have the proficiencies to use our, our armor yet, but we will very soon. And it's time for level two. And this means that we are going to take our first multi-class dip. And we are going to take a dip into Warlock. So as a first level Warlock, we get our patron immediately. And we're going to take the Hexblade. This gives us the Hex Warrior feature, which importantly gives us proficiency with light armor, medium armor, shields, and simple and martial weapons. So now we can use that scale mail and that shield that we had purchased. This also lets you bond with a one-handed weapon over the course of a long rest, and you can attack with your charisma instead of your dexterity or strength uh, with that weapon. You could absolutely use this, although I'm not planning on using this on this, on this build, and we are going to be more so a ranged blaster type character. We also get Hexblade's Curse here, and this is par a big part of the reason why I wanted this particular subclass. What this does is once per short rest, as a bonus action, we can mark a target. And whenever we damage them, we deal extra damage equal to our, our proficiency bonus. We can crit them on a 19 or 20, and if they die while under the effect of the curse, we recover a number of hit points equal to our Sorcerer level plus our Charisma modifier. And because we're going to be doing a large volume of attacks, this particular feature is going to enable us to do a whole bunch of damage. We also get the pack magic feature here, which is the Warlock's version of spell casting. We have a limited number of spell slots, but all our spell slots come back on a short rest, and they are all the same level in terms of pack magic. We get to learn two new cantrips here, and we're going to take Eldritch Blast. This is one of the core features of our build. As for your second cantrip, you can, you can pick whatever you want. I would probably take something more utility focused but it doesn't matter a huge amount we have two first level normal spell slots and our first level packed slot at this level and we get to learn two warlock spells i would learn hex or uh, a damage rider when our hex blade curse is not available it's pretty good at these early 
early levels, as well as the Armor of Agathis spell as just a measure of extra health and survivability. This spell also scales pretty well with high level slots and is very useful in general. Story-wise, I kind of uh, imagine that our Warlock Pact, perhaps we found a weapon associated with our Draconic Ancestry, but uh, for whatever reason, this um, our patron and Pact Magic is very fiery and flamboyant in their attitude and that kind of thing, and goes overall into our very fiery character, so to speak. All right, at level three, we are going to be a Warlock 2. Uh, this means that uh, our Pact Magic bumps up to two first level spell slots that come back on a short rest, and we get to learn another uh, spell here. I would take Hellish Rebuke. This lets us use our reaction and dump a spell slot to do some fire damage to our target uh, if they hit us. Um, and this is a, I think this fits appropriately pretty well with this character. Now, we also get two uh, Eldritch Invocations here as a second level Warlock, and the ones I want, our core one is Agonizing Blast. This lets us add our uh, Charisma modifier to each beam of our Eldritch Blast cantrip, so this is going to be huge for us in the long run. And for the second one, I'm planning on taking Devil's Sight. Uh, this gives us uh, Dark Vision out to a range of 120 feet, and importantly, we can see normally in both magical and non-magical darkness. We are planning on using this um, with a classic combo of casting the, world, the spell Darkness on ourselves, which creates a bubble of darkness that normal dark vision cannot penetrate. This will make it so our enemies can't see us, and therefore we get advantage on all of our attacks, and they have disadvantage on all their attacks against us. Pretty classic combo. But um, as an alternative, I would suggest getting Repelling Blast here instead. Now that said, we are still going to want Devil's Sight, at least in the near term in our early levels. Um, but, uh, the issue is that, um, you know, we don't actually want Devil's Sight in the long term because Darkness has a few kind of, um, tactical problems, uh, in certain circumstances. So we're eventually going to drop it for a different spell, but we won't have a way to get rid of Devil's Sight because we're not taking any more, uh, invocations and having Repelling Blast is generally speaking more useful. Now I'm going to talk about this a little bit as I progress the character, but we're actually going to have a way that we can kind of have the ability to swap these, although it won't result as a powerful of a character um, until a much later level. Um, so if you want to be more generally useful, I feel like having Repelling Blast is going to be really good. All right, but at level four, we are going back to Sorcerer. So as a second level Sorcerer, we get to learn another spell. Let's learn Absorb Elements to buff our defensive abilities. This lets us use our reaction to have incoming elemental damage. Really good um, defensive spell. And we also get our Sorcery points here. We will From here on out, we'll have a number of Sorcery points equal to our Sorcerer level. And we also get the Font of Magic feature. What this does is this basically lets us translate from Sorcery points to spell slots and, back and vice versa. Um, converting a spell slot into a sorcery point just gives you a number of sorcery points equal to the level of the slot. And this is a bonus action to, to do the conversion either way. And then converting from sorcery points into spell slots is more expensive. Um, but one of the cool things and one of the reasons why the sorcerer uh, warlock multiclass is so good is because you can convert your packed slots into sorcery points on a sh um, and then get them back on a short rest. So basically, this gives us short rest recharge sorcery points. So if it, if we're about to take a short rest and we've spent at least two sorcery points and we still have both of our first level uh, warlock slots left, we can convert them into sorcery points, which will net us two, and then take our short rest and we get our, our warlock slots back. And so this is a cool feature that this character will have and uh, is honestly something that makes uh, the, the, the sorcerer Warlock multiclass, really cool in general. All right, at level five, we are going to be a sorcerer level three, and we uh, get our meta magic here. So uh, this is a cool thing that is, is unique to sorcerers, and we can spend our sorcery points to kind of enhance our spells. Now we can only spend uh, we can only do one meta magic option per spell unless the option says otherwise. And the ones I'm gonna I I want to take here are quicken spell, and then I I was thinking about having subtle spell and i realized i wrote it here but i would actually take twin spell instead so quicken spell lets us spend two sorcery points to cast a spell as a bonus action instead of an action now remember we do have to follow the rules for casting spells with our bonus action so if we cast a spell with our bonus action no matter what the spell is the only other spells we can cast on that turn are cantrips with a casting time of one action 
So if we if we quicken a cantrip, we can only cast a cantrip with our action, and if we quicken a leveled spell, we can only cast a cantrip with our action. Now, Subtle Spell lets you cast a spell without uh, verbal or somatic or material components and can be really useful in certain situations, like you actually can't get counterspelled if you Subtle Spell. But I want to take Twin Spell so that we can twin things like Mind Sliver to help with our control. But again, the second one is more kind of pick your favorite, and, that, and so pick whatever one kind of suits your character and your campaign best. The power of our Cantrips also goes up here, so we now get to fire two Blasts with uh, Eldritch Blast. And, and all our other cantrips gain a damage dice. We now have second level spell slots um, as a third level caster. And so we get to learn our first second level spell. And I'm going to learn Scorching Ray. What this spell does is it fires off three blasts of fire. Um, you have to make an attack roll for each one. And each one deals 2d6 fire damage if it hits. Now, importantly, this works with Hexblade's Curse. So every... Uh, hit of Scorching Ray, we'll get to apply the flat damage from Hexblade's Curse. And in, in a way, this build is largely a Hexblade's Curse build, and the large volume of hits will help us trigger this extra damage a whole bunch of times. Also at this level, we are going to retrain Burning Hands into the Darkness spell. So our Darkness Devil Sight combo is now online, because Darkness is in fact a Sorcerer spell as well, well as a Warlock spell. This spell creates a 15-foot uh, radius sphere of magical darkness, and you, if you apply it to an object such as yourself, um, it will move with them. So this creates a bubble of darkness that normal dark vision cannot see through, but we can see through it because we have Devil's Sight. This is a pretty classic combo. So if we can see our enemies and they can't see us, we'll have advantage on all of our attacks. And this is kind of the key to having our high accuracy, at least at this level. Now, the main issue with this spell in the long term is typically your allies can't see through it. So if you're in tight uh, quarters, you might block the vision of all your allies. Uh, if an enemy is on top of you, your, your allies might not be able, able to attack them. So that's not the best. You, you're going to have to be very cautious about using uh, this spell in those cases. But overall, this is a very powerful combo, especially because a lot of spells require you to be able to see your target. And if the area is blocked by darkness, they can't see you. So therefore, they won't be able to target you. So this spell has both... Off offensive and defensive benefits for our character. At level six, we are a fourth level sorcerer and we get our first ability score increase or feat. And I'm going to take Elven Accuracy. This is a half feat. You can uh, bump your uh, dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, or charisma by one. We're going to bump our charisma. And then the cool thing about this is it says that when you make an attack roll using one of those four stats and you have advantage on the attack roll, you can reroll one of the dice once. So this creates what I like to call super advantage. So effectively, this says when you have advantage, instead of rolling the 2d20s, you can roll three. And this will just make us super accurate and hit very consistently regardless of the enemy armor class. Now, a cool thing about this is because Hexblade's Curse also expands our crit range to a 19. Uh, any individual attack is has a crit chance at this point of about 27%. Uh, so this build doesn't capitalize super heavily on those crits, but you're, you're going to get to roll a dice, a lot of dice. And in my opinion, rolling a lot of dice is fun. Now, this feat, uh, a pre prerequisite to having this feat is being an elf. So that's why we are a half elf and why any other race is good. In terms of our spell slots here and spells, we get to learn another cantrip, pick whatever you want and kind of fits the flavor of your character. We get another second level spell and we get to learn another spell. Now, the spell I would consider taking here is honestly Magic Missile. Um, but that said, if your table allows the Silvery Barb spell out of Strixhaven, I would absolutely take that instead. But the cool thing about Magic Missile is that Magic Missile also works with Hexblade's Curse. So every hit of the Magic Missile will apply the Hexblade's Curse flat damage. Um, so, and the spell also doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't have an attack roll, it just automatically hits. So if you really need to finish off an enemy, you can use this to do so. And I think the reliability of this and the ability to spread the damage out among multiple targets is very effective and a good thing to have around in your back pocket. All right, at level six, it is time for our first damage report. Now, uh, the way I do these, I look at our tactics. I always allow myself a single round of setup, and then I will look at our damage against uh, an enemy with an armor class of 10, and then an, an enemy with an armor, a higher armor class and save bonus that depends on our character level. So our tactics are at this point are as follows. In the first round, we're going to cast darkness on ourselves with our action, and then we're going to Hexblade's Curse, our primary target. 
And then at any point in round two and beyond, we're going to Quicken Scorching Ray, firing three rays of fire at them, and then Eldritch Blast, firing two rays at them with that. So here are our numbers at this point. We have three Scorching Rays with our super Elven Accuracy Advantage. Each of these is going to be doing 2d6 plus 3 fire. That plus 3 is from the Hexblade's Curse. That is our proficiency bonus. And these will crit on a 19 or 20. Then we have two Eldritch Blasts all up with a plus 7 to hit with our super advantage. Dealing 1d10 plus 7 force damage. Four of that is from our Charisma Modifier and our Agonizing Blast. And the other three is from our, our proficiency bonus. And these also crit on a 19 or a 20. Now I should mention here... Um, if you wanted to go the version that didn't take Elven Accuracy, you would take Eldritch Adept at level 4 and pick up Devil Sight. So that way uh, you would still have advantage, but you wouldn't have um, as much to... Uh, you, wouldn't ha you wouldn't have the super advantage and you your Eldritch Blast would do one less point of damage on average. But you would have your re re Repelling Blast for control. And the cool thing about the Eldritch Adept feat is that you have the ability to retrain um, the invocation that you got from that feat every time you, you gain a character level, which means that eventually when we stop using Darkness, we'll be able to swap out Devil's Sight for another uh, invocation of our choice. That said, that version of the build doesn't do as much damage as this one, at least until you get to the very end of, of the progression. Um, so while I'm talking about it, it's not the core one I'm presenting. Now, that said, here is our raw damage at this level. So against an enemy with an armor class of 10 and no bonus to their saves, we would do 63.7 damage on average. And against an enemy with an armor class of 15 and plus 5 to their saves, we would do 61.5 damage on average. Now, the cool thing about this is that there's only just, there's about two points of damage difference there against the enemy AC. And our hit chance is like in the upper 80s to 90s here. Um, so this character is super accurate, pretty consistent, and that's something that is really good. Now, compared to my other builds at this point, we are kind of bottom of the pack. Um, we are behind a lot of my more martial focused builds and, uh, you know, that kind of sucks. And at the same time, we were spending a fair amount of resources here, two of our second level spell slots, as well as two of our sorcery points to do this. Um, although we will get, you know, those sorcery points back on a short rest, thanks to being a sword lock. All right, but it's time to move, to move on. So at level seven, we are going to be a Sorcerer five and we get the magical guidance feature. This is an optional feature out of Tasha's. Uh, you don't have to have this, but this is a mainly an out of combat thing because you spend a sorcery point to reroll re a failed ability check and you must use the new result. A nice thing to kind of keep sorcerers relevant in terms of skills. And as a fifth level sorcerer, we now get our third level spells and slots. And I would learn the fireball spell here. Uh, this character would love to have an AoE blasting option, and you can't go wrong with a good old fireball. At level eight, uh, I'm going to take a little side detour into fighter here for a couple levels. Now I am putting the big, you know, burst tag stamp here, burst tech. Uh, because there is one reason why we're going fighter, and that is to get a feature at fighter two. Um, the, that feature is action surge and that will just help us deal more burst damage and that is what I'm building this character around so that's why I'm doing this if you don't want your character to do burst damage you are welcome to skip the fighter dip and keep going in sorcerer and there's nothing wrong with that character you will still have pretty decent burst damage when needed as well as pretty good sustained damage just because you have eldritch blast but as a first level fighter, we get second wind. So once per short or long rest, we can heal ourselves for 1d10 plus our fighter level. And then we get a fighting style. I would take defense on this character just to boost our armor class so to make us even more durable. At this point, assuming that we had managed to get half plate, we would have an armor class of 20 with the ability to boost it to 25 with the shield spell. And uh, yeah, that's pretty great and is a, it will, will, will make us pretty durable even if our enemies can hit us, which they probably won't be able to do because they'll never be able to see us. All right, at level nine, we are going to be a fighter two and that means we get action surge. So this is the burst tech feature I wanted here. So once per short or long rest, we can get an extra action on our turn with all the benefits thereof. And uh, we can use this to you know, become even more powerful for our burst damage. So it has been three levels. We're at level nine. It is time for our next damage report. So what has changed since last time? Well, we've gained third level spell slots and action surge, and that's about it. So let's see how that impacts our tactics and our damage. 
So in the first round, we are still going to set up by casting Darkness on ourself and then Hexblade's Cursing our target. And then in round any point in round two and beyond, we're going to quicken our Scorching Ray spell up to level three, so it'll fire four uh, rays. And then we're going to action, we're going to Eldritch Blast, Action Surge, and Eldritch Blast again. Because we cast a spell with our bonus action with quicken spell the only spells we can cast with our action are cantrips with the casting time of one action so we can only fire eldritch blast here so we're just going to pump out a bunch of them uh here's what our damage is like at this level we have a plus eight hit with super advantage uh with our four scorching rays each of them doing 2d6 plus four fire damage and critting on a 19 or 20. We now have four Eldritch Blasts thanks to Action Surge with that same plus to eight to hit and doing 1d10 plus eight force damage again with the expanded crit range. So against an enemy with an armor class of 10 and no bonus to their saves, we would do 111.6 damage. And against an enemy with an armor class of 16 and plus seven to their saves, we would do 107.2 damage. And since last time, this is an increase of 45-ish points or about 75% in either case. Um, which is honestly quite good, and one of the things I like about this build is that the scaling of our damage is pretty consistent going forward. Um, now, in terms compared to my other builds at this point, uh, we are we've gone from the bottom of the pack to more about the middle. We have caught my compound bow and stormborn builds at this point. That was an artificer archer as well as kind of a blaster, divine soul sorcerer, tempest cleric caster. We've also passed my crossbow rune knight build from a few weeks ago and we are doing better than a, a lot of the other builds in general actually that said we are behind a lot of the more powerful ones but again more middle of the road all right at level 10 we are going to continue in sorcerer and we're going to take sorcerer levels the rest of the way here so as a sorcerer level six we get the elemental affinity feature uh, associated with our draconic ancestry so that's going to be fire what this does is on the first so when we cast a spell associated with our elemental affinity, we get to add our charisma modifier to one damage roll of that spell. Now, unfortunately, uh, this doesn't work with all the beams of Scorching Ray. So just the first Scorching Ray gets to deal the extra damage equal to our charisma modifier. But if we were to cast, say, a fireball, all the enemies would take extra damage. At the same time, when we cast a, you know, a fire spell, we can spend one sorcery point to gain fire resistance for one hour, and this can be useful in the right situation. Uh, we also get another third level spell slot here, and we get to learn another third level spell. Uh, at this point, we kind of have the core of a lot of what we want, and I would learn counter spell just as an additional defensive measure to shut down enemy casters. At level 11, we are going to be a seventh level sorcerer, and as an 11th level character, the power of our cantrips goes up. We also get to start learning fourth level spells here. And I want to learn Ralathim's Psychic Lance out of Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. This is a psychic spell that blasts an enemy for a bunch of damage and then um, also applies a control effect at the same time if they fail their save. Uh, I, I, I believe it makes it so they can uh, take an action or a bonus action, but not both and that kind of thing. Um, pretty cool and powerful effect. Um, and uh, what... what one of the things I like about this is it, it targets intelligence saves and it's a damage plus control spell that does not require concentration. Now, importantly here, we're going to retrain the darkness spell into greater invisibility. This spell makes us invisible and doesn't break like the normal invisibility spell does when we attack or cast a spell or anything like that. So now we can become invisible to our enemies without blocking vision for our allies. Now, if you went for the Eldritch Adept version of the build and you have that feat instead of Elven Accuracy at this point, what you want to do is swap out your um, your your Devil Sight for probably Grasp of Hadar, which lets you pull an enemy 10 feet closer to you uh, once per turn when you hit them with Eldritch Blast. So if you're going with that version of the build, you will have the ability to push and pull enemies at will and kind of control their positioning. And I feel that that will make for an overall more effective character, although your damage won't quite be as higher. But nonetheless, we're going to pretty much abandon the darkness spell here unless it was kind of core to your party strategy and everyone was leaning in. At level 12, we are a sorcerer 8, and I'm going to use the this ability score or increase or feat to bump our charisma by 2 to 20 and cap it. You also get to learn another sorcerer spell here, and honestly, you can pick whatever you want. Um, I'm going to take Tasha's Mind Whip. This is a spell out of Tasha's uh, Cauldron of Everything, and it's another one of those uh, damage plus control spells. Uh, one of the cool things about this spell is when you upcast it, it targets an additional creature rather than um, you know do doing more damage. 
and you can use this to potentially control a group of enemies and again does not require concentration. Now, some of the other spells that you might want include things like Misty Step for teleportation, Wall of Fire for that damage over time and hazardous area, Fly, perhaps, if your party needs a fly speed, Polymorph, which you can potentially twin if you have that metamagic option, which you can use to get yourself or other allies out of danger and turn them into giant apes. You could take Enhance Ability to improve skill checks and support. You could take Haste to, and potentially twin it. You could take Hypnotic Pattern or Slow for control, etc. There are a lot of really good spells on, on the Sorcerer list. And one of the things I don't like about Sorcerers is just how much they're... The amount of spells they know is very small and it kind of limits what you can do. In a way, this is a balancing thing and I get that we have a whole suite of defensive spells. And if you weren't using uh, any of those, you could potentially drop one of them to have a good control spell as an alternative to our being invisible type strategy. At level 13, we are a sorcerer 9, and other than giving us a ninth sorcery point, we now get 5th level spells and slots, and I would learn Synaptic Static here. This is another one of those psychic spells like Tasha's Mind Whip and Ralphim Psychic Lance that targets intelligence saves and applies a control effect without requiring concentration. And this one, uh, it's basically like a psychic fireball and applies a kind of debilitating control effect at the same time. And I think that's something that would be fantastic for this character to have as kind of I envision their role as being kind of a, it, we're, we're going to be invisible, but we're also going to be blasting, doing damage per round with our Eldritch Blast. And when required, we, we want to do crowd control and AoE and that kind of thing. So again, overall, very effective spell because it applies a control effect without requiring concentration, which we're going to be using to become invisible. Level 13, it is time for our next damage report. So what has changed since last time? Well, a lot, since we've kind of gained four sorcerer levels. So we've gained fifth level slots and spells, as well as pretty much the entire psychic spell kit in Ralphim Psychic Glance, Tasha's Mind Whip, and Synaptic Static. We've also swapped our concentration over to greater invisibility, so we no longer block our ally's vision. We've also gained elemental affinity, which will add our charisma modifier to one of our fire... Uh, the damage of one of our Scorching Rays. We've capped our Charisma at 20, and the power of our Cantrips has gone up, so Eldritch Blast will now fire three beams per casting. So, in terms of our tactics, we're now going to cast Greater Invisibility on ourselves instead of Darkness, and then Hexblaze Curse our target in the first round. And then at any point after that, we're going to Quicken a Scorching Ray at level 5, firing six beams, and then we're going to Eldritch Blast three times, Action Surge, and Eldritch Blast three more times. So, this gives us six Scorching Rays with a plus 10 to hit with our Elven Accuracy Super Advantage, each doing 2d6 plus 5 fire, including it on 19 or 20. And our first Scorching Ray is the one that gets the Elemental Affinity buff, so it does 2d6 plus 10. Then we have six Eldritch Blasts, each doing uh, each with a 1d10, each with a plus 10 to hit with Super Advantage, our Elven Accuracy, doing 1d10 plus 10 Force Damage, and again, critting on a 19 or 20. So, at this point, we are doing 190.4 damage against an enemy with an armor class of 10, and 186 damage against an enemy with an armor class of 17. And e even with that uh, big gap in armor class, our difference our, in damage is only 4.4 points, which again is something I love about this character and just how accurate they are. Now, since last time, this is an increase of exactly 78.8 points against both armor classes, or about 70 to 74%. Now, in terms of where we are doing and uh, in terms of our other builds, we are pretty close to the top. Uh, I would say that we're like, I want to say three eighths of the way to the top. So we're a little above average here. And honestly, we are doing pretty well. Um, this character has pretty decent sustained damage. Uh, if you want to just Eldritch Blast and quicken Eldritch Blast on your rounds while you're invisible. And even if you're not going to burn your sorcery points, you still do a, a pretty decent amount of damage with your triple Eldritch Blasts here. While it's nothing to write home about uh, on those rounds, you, you do have those damage plus control spells to, to um, fall back on when needed. And honestly, I would probably be using those on a lot of turns, uh, especially after our, our burst round. All right. At level 14, we are a Sorcerer 10. We get to learn another meta magic here. I would probably learn Transmute Spell to potentially change the damage type of our fire. And, but you could honestly take anything that you want here. Uh, in terms of, we also get to learn another cantrip, pick whatever you want, and we also get to learn uh, another sorcerer spell of our choice that can be fifth level or lower. And honestly, I would say pick your favorite here. I would probably take a control or mobility spell on my character, so probably something like Misty Step, Dimension Door, or potentially Slow or something like that, or even Wall of Fire. It will probably depend on the campaign that you're playing, and we're more looking for a secondary concentration option here other than greater invisibility for when the situation calls for it. 
At level 15, we are a Sorcerer 11. That means six level spells and slots. Um, I'm going to take Chain Lightning here. We can potentially transmute it into fire if we want. Really nice AoE blasting damage. But honestly, again, you can pick your favorite and whatever is needed for your character. At level 16, we are a Sorcerer 12. Um, we don't actually get any new spells here, but you can retrain as desired. And we get a single ability score increase or feat. And now on this build, I'm going to take Eldritch Adept. Uh, this gives us any uh, invocation off the Warlock list. If the invocation has a prerequisite, we can only uh, uh, we can only take that invocation if we are a Warlock that also meets that prerequisite. And I'm going to take Repelling Blast. What this does is whenever we hit a creature with our Eldritch Blast, we can potentially push it back 10 feet. Now, importantly, if you took this feat earlier, like all the way back at level 4, you'd be, you'd be capping your Charisma here, and you would have retrained out Devil's Sight long ago. That said, there are lots of other options if you don't want to take Eldritch Blast. Something like Warcaster for advantage on your concentration would be pretty nice. Um, and there's a myriad of, of other feats. Take what feels best for your character, but I feel like I would probably want Repelling Blast on this character. And finally, at level 17, we are going to be a Sorcerer level 13. Uh, the power of our cantrips goes up here, so Eldritch Blast now fires four beams. And we get to learn a 13th Warlock uh, Sorcerer spell here. And I would take Force Cage. This is a super powerful non-concentration control option and is a really good spell in general. And I've talked about this a bunch in other videos. But honestly, I would consider retraining one of my spells here for the Dr Draconic Transformation spell. This is a really cool spell. It takes a bonus action to cast and uh, it, like lets you use your bonus action to do a, an area, area effect um, like breath weapon every turn and lets you fly and that kind of thing. Not, not, not necessarily the best spell, but I feel like the thematics of having this on a Draconic Sorcerer would be really cool and would, would be really fun. And so that's why I would consider potentially getting this spell on my limited list at this point. But at level 17, it is time for our final damage report. So what has changed since last time? Well, we've gained 7th level spells and slots. The power of our cantrip has gone up, so we now fire 4 Eldritch Blasts per beam. And we've got Repelling Blast out of Eldritch Adept. In terms of our tactics, they haven't really changed. Uh, in our burst round, we are upcasting Scorching Ray to level 7, so we'll now fire 8 beams, and we get a total of 8 Eldritch Blasts um, between our two sets thanks to Action Surge. In terms of our damage, we have plus 11 to hit with our Elven Super Accuracy, uh, and we have plus 6 on uh, flat for, from Hexblade's Curse at this point, and, you know, our first Scorching Ray still gets to add our Charisma, so it'll do 2d6 plus 11, and our Eldritch Blasts have plus 11 to hit with that Elven Super Accuracy and doing 1d10 plus 11 force damage each. And again, everything crits on a 19 or 20 thanks to Eldritch Blast. So, I guess an enemy with an armor class of 10 and no bonus to their saves, we would do 268.2 damage. And I guess an enemy with an armor class of 18 and plus 8 to their saves, we would do 260 damage. And overall, for our final report, this is really good. I'm very happy with how close these are together. Now, com uh, compared to our other builds at this point, um, we are, uh, actually doing better than a lot of them against the higher armor classes and pretty comparable against the, uh, lower armor classes. And we're pretty much in the same spot compared to my other ones that we were last time. So uh, above average, but not quite in the upper echelons of the best ones I've made to date. And for this character since last time, this is an increase of 75 to 78 points, depending on the enemy armor class or about 40%. And we've pretty consistently been seeing this scaling come in and a lot of this is because we've been gaining a couple caster levels and getting a bump to our cantrip scaling thanks to just the way those work so it is time to summarize what is the overall score of this build now to get this i take all of our numbers at all of our damage reports and average them into one number and for this character that is a 156.2 now, this is actually pretty good. Um, this is actually better than my first ever build, which I had set at a pretty solid baseline. My Fiend Knight uh, build, which was a uh, Eldritch Smiting Fiend Warlock Battlemaster. We are pretty far ahead of my baseline fighter builds at this point. We passed those builds around level 13, I would say, is when we completely um, eclipsed them. And again, this kind of puts us in that not quite the best, but still pretty good category. Now, if I was going to take this version of the build of 20, I think I would do Sorcerer 15, Warlock 3, or Sorcerer 16. Uh, it depends on if you want the extra ability score increase or feat, or if you really want to retrain Devil's Sight and get another invocation, as well as potentially boost your short rest sorcery points from 2 to 4. I think I would probably go the, the Warlock 3 version, but again, it really depends on your campaign. 
And if you didn't take the burst tech, uh, you know, you would be much more free to take, take extra levels in Warlock or, you know, I, I'll, though I'm, I'm not sure I would take more than three, so you would still be able to get ninth level spells by the end of your 20 level progression. Um, yeah, th that would uh, give you eight level spells. You also get flight uh, at Sorcerer 14 and again, a, a potential ability score increase. Now, in terms of alternate Sorcerer subclasses, you can pick whatever you, you want really um you would be trading a little bit of damage from that elemental affinity for a lot of control and utility especially if you took a sorcerer subclass like divine soul aberrant mind or clockwork that gets to learn extra spells and one of the things that i felt through when i was designing this character is how much i was hurting for uh a lot of the fun uh utility spells that i really like to have um and i was hurting quite a bit for those so Honestly, if I was going to play a character like this in a real game, I might consider going something like Clockwork or Aberrant Mind, probably Clockwork, to um, really be able to fill out the utility and control spells I would want to have as options on my character. Now, an interesting thing here that I wanted to, to uh, explain is how much damage does Hexblade's Curse contribute to our overall total? And the actual answer is it's about 40% of this character's damage. I compared uh, our damage at level 17 if we, if we weren't going to use the curse versus if we were and it drops it from about 260 points to about 155 or so so the flat damage plus the crit chance out of hexblade's curse is about 100 points of damage that that one feature is adding pretty crazy pretty powerful and so if you don't have this you probably don't necessarily want to go all in on burst as you you know will do 60 percent of your potential total um, I want to talk a little bit more about the early Eldritch Adept uh, version. This is the version that takes Eldritch Adept all the way back at level 4 and delays Elven Accuracy um, until character level 12. Um, the cool thing about this version is that you've got Repelling Blast early as well as Eldritch Sight, so you'll have the ability to manipulate and control the battlefield with positioning, which is something I think would be really nice to have in a real game. And if I was going to play this character um, or any version of them in a real game, I would honestly probably do this just to have that so I wouldn't be as reliant on um, Devil's Sight. Again, it depends on your campaign and the kind of situations that your Dungeon Master puts you into, but I, I really like having that forced movement uh, utility on my characters. Uh, one of the things that I do, I do like about this character is we do have control and area of effect options for when our single target burst isn't either isn't needed or isn't available. We are also we also have pretty solid damage per round thanks to having Eldritch Blast, and we are quite durable thanks to our massive suite of uh, defensive spells, as well as the fact that we've gained a bunch of extra hit points from Draconic Resilience. 140 hit points at level 17 on a character that has, a D, has predominantly D6 hit dice is actually really, really good. In terms of our defensive spell, we've got sh uh, we have shield, absorb elements, uh, potentially silvery barbs, as well as counter spell to defend ourselves. And overall, I feel like this character would be quite durable. Oh, and we're also invisible all the time, so our enemies can't even target us. So yeah, we're going to be pretty tough and hard to kill and lock down that kind of thing. We also have the option to use magic missile instead of scorching ray if the enemy is say resistant to fire damage or if they have a really high armor class although we shouldn't have any issue with that thanks to elven accuracy and once again man the limited spells known for the base player's handbook sorcerer uh subclasses really hurts uh i it would have been fantastic to have uh utility spells like enhance ability and misty step and other teleportation options earlier and if we were using something like clockwork soul we could potentially you know stash all of our defensive spells in their extra uh class spell list and then we would be able to have those spells so i think draconic sorcerer probably needs a rework but i'm pretty proud of how overall it worked on this character so thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed this draconic sorlock build please let me know what you thought in the comments. And if you have any other ideas um, or characters that I could create, please let me know. I love m making these videos, and this was overall a pretty fun one to do. So once again, my name is Nathan. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.